Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Feast of Trumpets 2012. And of course, now we will have trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, and the last great day, the great feast of God, which picture the greatness of God's plan, the greatness of his love and his mercy and goodness and kindness to the world. But in order to bring that to the world, He's got to send Jesus Christ back in power and strength and understanding. And we're going to see that this day, the Feast of Trumpets, marks the actual return of Christ and the resurrected saints to this earth and begin to set up the kingdom of God. Now we know in Leviticus 23 that God commands us to keep this holy day, and it's a special holy day. So let's read it now here, Leviticus 23 and verse 23. And as you know, all of the holy days of God are contained right here in the times that they are to be kept in Leviticus 23. Now we've gone over many calendar things so that we know that the calculated Hebrew calendar is the calendar that God has given to us so that we can have the appointed times that he has given in their seasons in the time that he wants them. And how the decalculated Hebrew calendar is so accurate that any other devising or any other plan by men, regardless if they use scriptural terms or not, does not make them valid. So let's begin in verse 23, Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, So you see, what is called the law of Moses is the law of God that God gave through Moses. And you cannot find one thing in the first five books of the Bible where it says, and Moses commanded the people instead of God. He brought the word of God. So he says, verse 24, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of ram's horns or trumpets a holy convocation. Now this was, in in blowing the trumpets, they were to blow the trumpets as far as we are able to tell all day long. So this was quite a celebration indeed. You shall do no servile work therein. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And yes, we are to bring an offering on the holy days as God has commanded. Now, we know in Deuteronomy 16 that it specifically mentions the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles, and it doesn't mention trumpets or atonement, nor does it mention the last great day. However, the command to bring an offering is given. And so we certainly should bring an offering to God as we are able. Now let's understand a principle that God has given here in Matthew, the 10th chapter. Matthew 10. Now let's turn there. Because God operates on what you would call the principle of reciprocity, which is this. We are to freely give the gospel. And those who receive it, receive it without cost. However, once we know the laws and commandments of God, we are to freely give of what we have of our increase that God has given us. And we know that God is able to make all grace abound to us in everything that we do and see that we have sufficiency in all things. And the blessings come not before 
our obedience and love to God, but afterwards. And sometimes the trials that we go through to get there, it doesn't look like it's too good right at first. But remember, God's Word is true. God's Word is holy. His promises are sure, and we can claim them. Now here in Matthew 10, and let's pick it up here in verse 7, after he told the apostles to go out and preach the gospel, As you are going, proclaim, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So if you freely receive of the preaching of the gospel, of the benefits of being healed, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, then we are to freely give. On this particular trip that they went on, Christ wanted to prove a point, that he would provide for them on this journey. But this is not how they were to do it continuously, because Jesus said, after this, you take a purse, you take a sword, you take extra clothing, you provide for yourself. So. The principle of reciprocity is, you give, that makes it possible to give to others. They give, it makes it possible to give to others. We give of what? How does God command us to do it? See, Now this was specifically that they were not to charge. This does not mean that you do not give anything to God. This does not mean that there is not tithing. This does not mean that we do not give offerings. But this was specific for this tour that they took to preach the gospel. And then there are a lot of other things that are associated with it. Now then, Let's come to Romans, the eighth chapter. And let's see how God is able to make all things work together for good, regardless of the difficulties, regardless of the problems, regardless of the circumstances. And this is why we are in faith to give our tithes and give our offerings, and why then we use it to preach the gospel. And certainly today, the way we're able to do it with all of the modern technology that we have is certainly a tremendous way of doing it. So here in verse 28, Romans 8, always remember this, brethren. Always remember God loves you. God has called you. You are under God's grace. He is dealing directly in your life. And he wants us to collectively together preach the gospel and reach out to the world. So this is what we're doing. Verse 28, now we know, and this is what we have to realize that everything that we do, we know. That's why you have to know God. You know his commandments. You know his truth. You know his word. You have proved all things and hold fast to that which is good. You have the love of God, the faith of God, the hope of God. You're standing in the grace of God. So therefore, we know that all things work together for good. In the end run, they're all going to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so, as we give, Let's keep all of this in mind. And so we'll take a pause right now, and we will take up the offering for the Feast of Trumpets 2012.
The Feast of Trumpets is a great day of God and pictures a great and fantastic thing that's going to take place. Because, you see, the return of Christ is not going to be secret. It's not going to be done in a corner. It is going to be a worldwide event. With a great many things that take place leading up to it. Now, the Feast of Trumpets is not the day of the resurrection. The Feast of Trumpets is a war feast. The Feast of Trumpets does not have the last trumpet for the resurrection blown on the Feast of Trumpets. It is a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Now, Remember this, every holy day the trumpet was to be sounded. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we will see that the seventh trump is blown long before the time that Christ and the saints return to the earth. And this is why Pentecost, being the harvest of the first fruits, and we are the first fruits, that is pictures the day of the resurrection. And as we have shown from the Feast of Trumpets, that the resurrection has already occurred before the event of bringing the government of God through Christ and the saints to the earth. They're all resurrected, and we meet Christ in the air on the sea of glass. And we watched the seven last plagues poured out. And that's quite an event to take place, all of those. So let's look at how, how it is here with the world. Now let's come to Matthew 24, and as we're turning there, let's talk about another scripture in Zechariah 12 where God says, though all the nations of the world are gathered around Jerusalem, it will be a burdensome stone, a troublesome stone, and it's going to be a disaster for this world. Now we come to Matthew 24, and we see everything is centered at Jerusalem. So the starting of the preaching of the gospel centered beginning at Jerusalem. The ending of it is also going to center in Jerusalem. Now there are some keys that we're told here concerning this, concerning the day, concerning the times. Now look at all the difficulties and problems that we have been going through. Look at all the fires, all the drought, all the tornadoes, earthquakes, just exactly as Jesus said. And all the false prophets, as Jesus said, many would come in his name saying that he was the Christ and deceive many. The reason is because people do not know or study their Bibles. Be interesting. Ask the average Christian who goes to the average Sunday-keeping church about various parts of the Bible, and they won't know anything about it. So they use the name of Christ. Now, as I've covered before, Matthew 24 pictures the time of the end and the things that will be taking place at the end. And actually, when you look at it, it gives us a clue that shows that there is rapid modern communication. So let's read some of these things that are going to take place. Verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And we have a good means of hearing them, don't we? Radio and television and the Internet. And what's happening? Wars and rumors of wars. But he said, don't let these things disturb you, for it is necessary that all these things take place, but the end is not yet. 
Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in different places. And that's exactly what we are seeing. And what we're going to see is more intensity with these things. Then we also see the time is coming. Then shall they deliver you up to affliction, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many shall be led into sin, and shall betray one another, and hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and deceive many. And because lawlessness shall be multiplied, and we've covered that in recent sermons, multiplied, made official law of the land, and people not understanding what is happening, people trying to do good, but it never works out right trying to correct a problem, but only to create more problems. Lawlessness, breakdown of the family, breakdown of the things that have to do with understanding about God, breakdown of society with mobs and riots, and the whole system leading to the great crisis at the end. But here's a promise. Here's a promise even though the love of many is going to grow cold because of this lawlessness, this promise we need to understand. The one who endures to the end, that one shall be saved. Now what does this tell us? This is a warning that there are going to be times that are going to be very difficult to handle. And we have to endure through them. God will see us through all of it. God will watch over us. God will take care of us. Now, when it comes time for the martyrdom, then God is still going to watch over us. Yes, we may lose our lives. If we're martyred, there's no question we will lose our lives. But God is with us in it. Did not Jesus give his life so that we might have life? Yes, he did. So those things are going to be happening. And then he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then shall the end come. Now we're going to see why to all nations. Because the events that are going to transpire, the people of the world must be warned that these things are coming. Now we realize, as we will see on the Day of Atonement, that Satan the devil is right there to try and change these things, to try and turn these things around, to try and convince us that yes, we can have peace. Yes, we'll have a world system. Yes, this is going to be great and wonderful. So Satan is going to have his rescue plan and it's going to look very awesome indeed. But remember, Satan's plan is temporary, and it's all going to collapse. Because when there is the abomination of desolation that stands in the holy place, and this shows that a temple must be built, then shall be great tribulation. And this is going to start things off, and we're going to see that it will not end until the final day of trumpets. And some of these things during the three and a half years are going to increase in intensity. Yes, they will say peace and security, peace and prosperity. But then, as we're told in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, sudden destruction shall come upon them. Now, let's look and see who God holds responsible for the things that are going to take place. Let's come to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. And let's see how important it is, how religion fits in, and how government fits in. Because here we're talking about shepherds, and we're talking about
prophets both. Ezekiel 13. Now this tells us an awful lot. Here it is, the prophets of Israel. Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, again, doesn't this sound like doesn't this sound like God coming to Moses? Yes. Well, Jesus was the word. Jesus was God. Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. So the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy. And say to those who prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear the word of the Lord. You better listen to God. Because the Feast of Trumpets shows that God is getting down to business of ending the reign of Satan the devil and the governments of men cut off from God. Let's read on. Thus says the Lord, Woe to those foolish prophets who have followed their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like the foxes in ruins. Yes, they are there, just searching out whatever they can get. You have not gone up into the breach, nor built the wall for the house of Israel, that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. No, totally unprepared. And that's what this feast pictures, the day of the Lord. Now, when you have a day fulfilled in prophecy, we're talking about the year of the Lord. And we will see how God starts it out. And it's going to be quite a thing. This world is going to know that it is God. However, in the deception of Satan the devil, most of the world except those few uh, who repent, they're going to believe that this is an alien invasion. And in a sense, that's true because the world doesn't know God. The world doesn't know the angels of God. But the aliens, Satan, the devil, and the demons, they know. So everything is upside down and backwards. So God says here, verse 6. Now, before we get into verse 6, I just want you to read the whole book of Jeremiah. And you will see what God did over and over and over again to try and warn the people. And you will see what the false prophets did to say, no, these things aren't going to happen. But they did. So God says to them, they have seen vanity and lying divination, and who is the father of lies? Who gives this divination? And divination is demonism, saying, the Lord says. Now, isn't that exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many? But notice what God says. And the Lord has not sent them. But they hope to confirm their word. Of course, they couldn't confirm God's word. Only their word. Did you not see a vain vision and a lying divination when you say, The Lord says, although I have not spoken, and what is the greatest lying divination that's going to take place? For the religionist. No rapture. There will not be a rapture. The Bible does not teach it. It is the figment of misinterpretation and lies that ministers have used to merchandise people and try and increase their numbers. Notice what God says here in verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you spoke in vanity and seen lies. 
Therefore, behold, I am against you, says the Lord God. And my hand shall be against the prophets who see vanity and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor shall they be written in the writings of the house of Israel, nor in the book of life. Nor shall they enter into the land of Israel, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, just like they say back, it was prophesied back there in First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. There's going to come a time when they're going to say, Peace and safety, peace and prosperity, peace and security. And there was no peace. And when anyone builds a weak wall, they cover it with whitewash. Oh, we have a plan. Oh, let's work this device. Pray tell me, what plan of man has ever withstood against God? Not one. And what does the psalm say? Unless the Lord build the house, the weary builders toil in vain. And that's exactly what's happening in Christianity. It is all falling apart. Now let's continue on here. Notice what they say. Verse 11. Say to those who cover it with whitewash that it shall fall. There will be a flooding rain, and you, O great hail, shall fall, and a windy storm will break forth, and behold, when the wall has fallen, shall it not be said to you, Where is the white war with which you have covered it? What happened? Well, you see, they don't understand the power of God. And they don't understand what God is going to do. We'll see that in just a little bit. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury, and there shall be a flooding rain in my anger, and hail storms, stones in fury to destroy it. And I will break down the wall that they have covered with whitewash, and I will bring it down to the ground, yea, I will expose its foundations, and it shall fall, and you shall be destroyed in her midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now that's one of the themes of the book of Ezekiel. So when you get done reading Jeremiah, read the book of Ezekiel. Now that's some book. And anyone who considers himself a prophet, consider what God asked Ezekiel to do. And when you read the first part of it, and see what God asked Ezekiel to do. Ask yourself, am I willing to do that? Let's go on now. Verse 15, And I will fulfill my wrath on the wall and on those who cover it with whitewash, and I will say to you, the wall is no more. Those who whitewashed it are no more. That is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem, who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, says the Lord. So God is against them. But God is going to let them build their world system first. We see that in Revelation 13. Now let's see what's going to happen in the day of the Lord. There are a lot of things to talk about the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. Let's come to Daniel, the 12th chapter. Now in the Bible, the Holy Bible in its original order, you come back from Chronicles to Nehemiah, then Ezra, then Daniel. So this should be fairly easy to find. Daniel, the 12th chapter. Let's see what this time is going to be. Just exactly like Jesus said. 
when you see the abomination of desolation, then shall great tribulation begin, such as has not been from the beginning of the world. Now, those are awesome times. But brethren, let's understand something very important. All of God's prophecies are going to be fulfilled to the maximum. Not the minimum. Not just a little eensy teensy bit and someone can say, oh, look over here, there was a, one of the great prophecies of God that has been fulfilled. No, these are going to be worldwide. These are going to be world-shaking. Now let's see how it was revealed to Daniel. Verse 1, Daniel, the 12th chapter. And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who shall be found written in the book. Now that can refer to two things book of life, and also may have an application to the 144,000 who will have their names at that time when God intervenes to save them, their names will also be written in the book of life. Verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. Now this is at the time of the resurrection with at Pentecost, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now that has to be the fulfilling of the last great day in destroying the wicked. But notice the promise, and always remember that God always gives encouragement before the times of trouble come. And he always holds before us the goal so we know that enduring th through these things is worth it because what God is going to give us is eternal life and glory and a share of the inheritance. So he says here, verse 3, and those who are wise shall shine as the, firm, as the brightness of the firmament. And they who turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Now notice, that caps off the whole book of Daniel, which describes nearly all the major events to happen at the end time. And then we're told over here that he says, verse 9, Daniel is told to go your way, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. And you see, God gives us understanding through his holy days. God gives us understanding combined with his word, combined with his spirit, combined with the time that it is to make those things known, and combined with our understanding of the word of God. Now let's come to Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. And what we'll begin to do is see that all the prophecies concerning the Feast of Trumpets are worldwide events leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. And God gives warning. Right here in Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, but Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Remember it says, 
and this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness. And a witness is a warning. And a witness is a testimony against. So notice what God says here in Isaiah 34. Come near, you nations, to hear. And you people, hearken. Let the earth hear in its fullness the world and its offspring. For the anger of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury is upon all their armies. They need to think about this. This is talking about end time events. He has completely destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter and that could only happen with the fulfillment as we will see toward the end of this sermon in Revelation 19. Now something else is going to take place before that because God is going to let his presence be known in a fantastic and tremendous and awe-inspiring and fearful and frightful way. Never before has this happened in this way, nor will it happen again. Notice what he says here in verse 4. We will see that this is described in several places. Verse 4, And all the host of the heavens shall be dissolved. Heavenly signs, and the heaven shall be rolled up like a scroll. Where do we find that? Revelation, the sixth chapter. When God begins to sh reveal himself, when Christ shows he's the Lord God of heaven and earth, and the heavens roll back as a scroll, he's going to shake the heavens, shake the earth, shake the sea, shake all nations. This is going to be tremendous. And all their hosts shall fall down. Now that's their armies. As a leaf falls off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword is bathed in the heavens. God has prepared this battle. Behold, it shall come down upon Edom. Now, Edom, that's another name for what we could call Esau, which also applies today to the Muslim world. And they're going to be fighting Christ with all the other nations. But Edom, this shows geographically where it's going to be in the Middle East. And upon the people of my curse for judgment, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It's made fat with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, and with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. So it's going to come down. It's going to be a bloody mess. And we're going to see how far-reaching this is going to be. Verse 8, it says, It is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year to repay for the fighting against Zion. So that's going to be quite a thing. And that day is coming. Let's come over here to Jeremiah, the 25th chapter. Now, in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah did not fulfill this prophecy. That's why it's in the Bible for us today, because it applies at the end times. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. God gave him a cup. He said, take this cup and go to all of these nations all of the nations that are upon the face of the earth. Jeremiah 25. 
quite a chapter, really lays everything out. There is not one nation that is not included in this. And when you go back to Revelation 13, and you read what it says there, that this world government has power over every tribe and language and nation and peoples on earth. Now let's read it here. They will drink of that cup. It will happen as God has said. Verse 26, Jeremiah 25. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, all the kingdoms of the world, which are on the face of the earth. Now think about that. God means what he says and says what he means, and it means exactly that. And the king of Shishak shall drink after them. That's another name for the coming beast power. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink and be drunk, and vomit and fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall come to pass, if they refuse to take the cup at your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. For lo, God says, I begin to bring evil on this city which is called by my name. And think of the evil that's coming upon Jerusalem in the end time. And shall you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. Now, when God says something, he means it. And prophesy against them all these words and say to them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar over his dwelling place and shall give a shout like those who tread out the grapes against all the people of the earth. So this day of trumpets, though it's a holy day, it's a day for us to understand it represents the power of God, the return of Christ, the showing and declaring of the kingdom of God. Now this happens after the resurrection has taken place at Pentecost. And all those who are in the first resurrection will be on the sea of glass to watch all of these events take place. Now let's continue on. A noise shall come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, and he will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be stirred up from the farthest corners of the earth. Now notice what's going to happen in that day. Now this is something. And verse 33, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be mourned, nor gathered, nor burned. They shall be as dung upon the ground. Now, that's the result of this world system. Now, let's continue on. Let's come here to Isaiah 13. It tells us what God is going to do. See, these prophecies are here for a reason. Isaiah 13. Let's turn there, and before we begin reading there, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll pick it up after the break.
Now let's continue on in Isaiah 24. Let's see the prophecy here. Because, brethren, the return of Jesus Christ is going to be an absolutely fantastic thing. Greater than anything we can imagine. Even the prophecies here that describe it cannot give us the total visualization of what it's going to be. Isaiah 24 and verse 1. Behold! The Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste and turns it upside down and scatters its inhabitants. That's the way it's going to be. And as it is with the people, so shall it be with the priest. As with the slaves, so with the master. As with the handmaid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor because that's when they're going to throw their gold and silver into the streets, because they will know there is no money, no kind of money, that can bring them safety or get them out of this mess. Verse 3, listen to these words. The earth shall be completely laid waste and utterly stripped. You see, God is going to get rid of every vestige of this world's satanic, Babylonian, sodomite civilization. It is going to be destroyed. See, because God is not going to build on the foundation of men. He's going to bring Christ, who is the rock the saints who are the kings and priests to reign with him. And they will establish the right civilization, the kingdom of God. Verse 4. The earth mourns and languishes. The world withers and languishes. The proud people of the earth wither. The earth is defiled under its people because they have transgressed the laws, the laws of God. They have changed the ordinances, the holy days of God, and have broken the everlasting covenant. That's amazing. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and they who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the people of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Now, we don't know how many people are going to be left, but compared to the population of the world, it's going to be few. Now, let's come over here to Haggai, the second chapter. Let's see how this was promised back here, the book of Haggai. So you have the book of Zechariah going backwards, then Haggai, and then you come to Zephaniah. Here's the book of Haggai. Let's see what it says in chapter 2. Haggai 2. And let's pick it up here in verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once again, it is yet a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations who is Christ shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts, that is, the temple that he will build when he returns. And by the way, that's not the temple of Ezekiel 40 forward. You read that very carefully. And those descriptions and measurements are from the temple in Jerusalem before it was destroyed in 586 B.C., 
Now, since we're right here with Haggai, let's come back to the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1. Chapter 1. And let's see what God's judgment is going to be and how severe it's going to be. This is why when we take over the kingdom of God, brethren, we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of lives to repair those who survive through it. Notice what God says here. Think about this in relationship to the other scriptures we have already read up to this point. I will utterly consume all things from the face of the earth, says the Lord. Going to change the whole thing. He's going to make it right. Going to bring it back, the restitution of all things, to what it should be. Verse 3, Zephaniah 1. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and all the people of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place, and the name of the idolatrous priest with the priest. Isn't that something? and those worshiping the host of heavens upon the housetops, and those worship swearing to the Lord, and also swearing by Milcom, and those who have turned away from the Lord, and who have not sought the Lord, nor asked of him. Boy, that's going to be a time, isn't it? Now notice, be silent before the face of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has appointed his sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. That's us. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the rulers and the king's children, and all who are clothed with strange garments. And in that day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold and who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Boy, this is something. Let's see what this day is going to be like. Verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and comes swiftly. The sound of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry bitterly there. The day of, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of ruin and devastation a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of ram's horns and alarm against the fortified cities, against the high towers. This is an all-out thing that's going to happen. Now, after this, we're going back to the book of Revelation, and we're going to see how that is laid out and how the trumpets are blown. Because this Feast of Trumpets pictures that last year leading from trumpets to trumpets. I will bring distress upon men so that they shall walk as blind because they've sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole earth shall be devoured by the, f fur by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even an end, yea, an end, a terrible end of all of those who dwell upon the earth. Now that may be even blend into the ending of the last great day with the burning of the wicked, destruction of them, the lake of fire. Now let's come back to the book of Revelation. Let's see how these things are going to unfold. Because here in the book of Revelation, we have a description of the sequence of the seven trumpets. And that's what this day pictures. The seven trumpets that will be blown from trumpets to trumpets in the very last year now remember, after the heavens and earth have been shaken, 
there's a period of about four, four and a half months from Pentecost until trumpets. And the world, after the earth has been shaken, is going to need that time to recoup from everything that has shaken the earth. Now they'll be able to recoup, gather themselves together, and then they'll continue on with their wars. But now, here in the last year, from trumpets to trumpets, begins in chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. So if you'll turn there, please. Now we see the things change from what we saw with the opening of the seals. Now instead of men against men in their wars and battles and finally their execution of the saints in martyrdom because they want to get everyone who will not fit into the system. And when the saints have been martyred and the only ones alive in the flesh that are saints are the ones in the place of safety, which will be few indeed. Then there's going to be the sealing of the 144,000 from the children of Israel and a great innumerable multitude which will take place on the next to the last Pentecost. Then from Pentecost until trumpets, you have that space of time of about four and a half months. Then everything changes at that point. When the seventh seal is opened, everything changes. Verse 1, Revelation 8, And when he, that is Christ, because he's the one who opens the seals, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God with seven trumpets given to them. And another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and much incense was given to him so that he might offer it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that was before the throne. Now, the saints are those who have been received the Holy Spirit. All of those who have been martyred are dead. All of those who are in a place of safety are the few. But before the beginning of the trumpet plagues, there's the sealing of the 144,000 in great innumerable multitude, and they are also saints at that time, which shows they're going to be praying, thanking God, asking for God's intervention. Will this be like it was with the children of Israel in Egypt when God severed the plagues from coming upon the children of Israel? God will protect the 144,000, the great innumerable multitude, their prayers going up to God. See, God's throne is active. Now then, here comes a tremendous event that is going to take place, and we're going to see that the first four trumpet plagues come in rapid succession, just exactly like the first four seals. So let's pick it up here in verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, you go through the book of Revelation, and you go through the prophecies that explain about it, there are going to be a lot of earthquakes. There are going to be a lot of things that take place. Now, notice, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound their trumpets. And this is the fulfilling of the fantastic meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. It is beginning. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there was hail and fire mingled with blood, and it was cast upon the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Awesome events to take place. 
God is going to make sure that men understand this is from God. But you see, because they won't repent. They think it's an alien invasion. Well, the angels are aliens to them. And Christ is an angel, an alien to them. And all the resurrected saints will be aliens to them as well. Verse 8, Then the second angel sounded his trumpet, and there was cast into the sea, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures that were in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Tremendous destruction, see. Under Satan the devil, in his wrath and in his fury against God, and men dedicated to evil, men trying to protect their greatest work, this great government of of man on earth, a one world system that we have finally gotten and now these aliens are coming to try and take it from us. So that was something. And a third angel sounded his trumpet and there fell out of heaven a great star like a burning lamp and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of waters. Now the name of the star was Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from drinking the waters because they were made bitter. Poisonous water. Then the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was smitten, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third part of the day did not shine, likewise a third part of the night. Everything is upside down. This is why no man knows the day or the hour, even though we understand that they're pictured by the holy days, and in this case, by the Feast of Trumpets. When this is, begins at the next or the last Feast of Trumpets, when will the next one be? And there's every indication to show that this last year is also what is called an intercalated or leap year, making it 13 months long. Now let's go on. If you think that's bad, now here's another warning. Verse 13, And I looked and heard an angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to those who are dwelling on the earth because of the voice of the remaining trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound their trumpets. So it's going to come. Increasing destruction, increasing slaughter, increasing war. So the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to the earth, and there was given to him the key of the bottomless abyss. That's the prison where all the demons are. And he opened the bottomless abyss, and there went up smoke from the pit, like the smoke of a great fire, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then locusts came up unto the earth from the smoke. Demons coming out now to assist men in their wars against other men. Here is the place where the king of the north hears of tidings from the north and the east. And he goes away to make waste and go against them. Yes. And they had power like scorpions of the earth, and was said to them that they should not damage the green grass, because by the time these other things took place, all the grass that was burned up, what happens when it burns up, and then water is given to it? It grows back. So there's green grass growing back. So God says this time, don't damage the grass, or any green, green thing, or any tree but only the men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And who are the ones that have the seal of God in their foreheads? 
the 144,000 in the great innumerable multitude, and those who are in the place of safety. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, that is, with this scorpion plague, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion, when it stings a man. And in those days men shall seek death, but will not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for war, and on their heads were crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. And they had all this futuristic weaponry and protection and armor. They had breastplates like iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots drawn by many horses running to war. And they had tails like scorpions and stingers, and it was given them to have power to injure men with their tails for five months. And they had over them a king, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but his name, he has a name in Greek that is called Apollyon. That's none other than Satan the devil. The first woe is past. Now think about all those scriptures we read in the Old Testament leading up to this time. And what's going to happen to human beings? How many dead there are going to be? The blood just flowing like rivers. Well, the kings of the east, the army of two the armies of two hundred million, they will be strong all the way back to the Far East. You can't get 200 men in one place at one time. Now maybe even some of those armies will end up being those that are destroyed in Ezekiel 38 and 39. After the kingdom of God has been set up on earth. But notice what this is. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar, the golden altar that is before God. And it said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Loose the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates for this purpose. Then the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were loosed that they might kill a third of men. So the slaughter is going to be awesome indeed. And men are going to learn by this. You never defy God and get away with it. You can never fight against God. And how dare you ever again to think about changing his laws or his commandments or his Sabbath or his holy days. That's why Christ and saints are going to set up the kingdom of God. Not going to leave it to men. No, to Christ and the saints. So it describes them, numbers them. Verse 16, And the numbers of the armies of the horsemen was 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And so I saw the horses in vision, and those sitting on them who had fiery breastplates. Then it describes what they do. Great awesome power of fire shooting out of their out of their their heads and out of their tails. Verse eighteen by a third of these by these three, a third of men were killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone that they shoot out of their mouths. And the power is in their mouths, for their tails are like serpents. 
and have heads, and with them they inflict wounds. Now notice the attitude of men. They are so dedicated to fighting against this alien invasion that they don't even consider that it's God. Verse 20, But the rest of the men who were not killed by the plague still did not repent of the works of their hands, that they might not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which do not have the power to see, nor to hear, nor to walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thievery. These are awesome and terrible times. That's why the Feast of Trumpets is to remind us and teach us what God is going to do. And we can learn some great lessons from God in this. Yes, indeed. Then we have the seven thunders. Now, we're not going to go through what it says there in chapter 10, except to say this. John was told, do not write what the seven thunders did. Now then, very simple to understand. No one knows what the seven thunders are because it wasn't written down. Now we come to chapter 11, and we want to pick it up with verse 15, and this occurs on the last Pentecost, the resurrection of the saints from the dead. Now, out of seven trumpets, which one is the last one? Seventh trumpet, correct? When are the dead raised? At the last trump. So let's read it. Does this describe a resurrection of the saints? Yes, it does. And they will be raised, as we saw, on the day of Pentecost and on this great sea of glass right over Jerusalem and the whole area of Palestine. Let's see what it says. Verse 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe comes immediately. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were great voices in heaven saying, Now we're hearing from the voices in heaven, the angels, the 24 elders, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Here's what they said. Now think of this coming down to the earth. It's going to be heard in all the earth. This isn't going to be some little sound, a little tinky, tinky, little teeny, weeny, weeny thing, bell going off, you know, okay? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign into the ages of eternity. And does that not fulfill Isaiah 9, where it says, And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Yes, indeed. And the 24 elders who sit before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come, for you have taken to yourself your great power and have reigned. For the nations were angry, summarizing all that has gone on, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead to be judged. That's us and to give reward to your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to all those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Now that's the first resurrection. 
And we know that in Matthew 24 and in Luke 13, it says the angels are going to take us up to meet Christ in the air. And guess what's going to be in the air in the clouds, the sea of glass. And there we're going to meet him. And there we're going to meet all the other saints. There everything that we described on Pentecost is going to take place. And then after that takes place, then the seven last plagues are poured out. So let's read them. See, and as we read them, let's ask the question. It's an awesome power that's necessary to destroy the evil of men and Satan and demons. And that at this point they become so desperate that they finally have their final suicide battle to fight against the alien invasion, the battle of Armageddon. So chapter 16, seven last plagues are poured out. Now we know that they're all gathered to Armageddon toward the end of these plagues. So let's read it here. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels who received the seven last plagues in their vials, Go and pour out the vials of the wrath of God onto the earth. And the first angel went and poured out his vial onto the earth, and an evil and grievous sore fell upon men who had the mark of the beast and upon those who were worshiping his image. And the second angel went out and poured out his vial into the sea, and it became blood like the blood of dead men, and every living soul in the sea died. See, God is going to have to do a complete repair of the whole earth to bring it to the restitution of what it was when he created it. And the third angel poured out his vials upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard an angel, the angel of the waters, say, You are righteous, O Lord. Notice how the angels of God view these things from a human perspective, not knowing God, not knowing his plan, not understanding about the second resurrection. Men don't like to see all of this blood, guts, and gore, and death. But notice how the angels view it. So the angel of the waters said, you are righteous, O Lord, who are and who was, even the Holy One, in that you have executed this judgment. For they have poured out the blood of the saints and of prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. This is the blood avenging by Jesus Christ himself of all of the blood that evil men have shed in executing the prophets and the saints. And I heard another voice from the altar say, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial in the sun, and power was given to it to scorch men with fire. So there's going to be a big flash and great heat is going to come from the sun. Now, we don't know how long it's going to last, but notice what it is. Scorched men with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. They don't yet die with it. They're burned with it. Some may die of it, but notice what they say. They blaspheme God, who has authority over these plagues, and they did not repent to give him glory. What's it going to take? What's it going to take for some people to repent? I tell you, this is amazing. 
Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed with their tongues because of the pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Yet they did not repent of their works. Now then there's a little reprieve again. And they think, yes, oh, we've got a chance to save this. We've got a chance to rescue this. Oh, yes. Then verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial into the river Euphrates, and the waters were dried up so that the way of the kings of the rising of the sun might be prepared. So then the rest of the armies of the 200 million, not all of them, some of them will carry over into the millennium. And they will be destroyed, Ezekiel 38 and 39. But here they come again. Now this time, they have to be convinced. There has to be supernatural signs for them to want to come up and start fighting after all that they have suffered here. And the sixth angel poured out his vial. We read that, verse 3. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For these are spirits of demons working miracles going forth to the kings of the earth, even of the whole world. See, just like the, the priests a Pharaoh's court had power to do miracles. Now, these demons come out and do miracles and convince the rest of the world, we've got a chance to win. Now, let's all get together and do this. And in their own delusion, God is going to trap them in their own scheme. even of the whole world, to gather them together to the battle of the great day of the Almighty God. Behold, I come as a thief. So here's a warning. Warning to the Laodiceans, because you will understand all of these things at the end time. So we need to be warned. Blessed is the one who is watching and keeping his garments, so that he may not walk naked and they may not see his shame. Now that was just an interjection right there as a warning. And God does that many times. You read along and then he will interrupt the flow of things to give a warning to help us to come to our senses so that we don't do like these evil men here. And they rely upon their own ways and their own schemes. Now just like God lured Pharaoh and his armies to come after the children of Israel and to go into the Red Sea. So he uses the demons to bring them all to this battle. But it's God who was doing it. And he gathered them together to the place that in the Hebrew tongue is called Armageddon. Now they're all there. They're ready for this battle. They're looking up at the sea of glass. They understand what has happened. Now they have marshaled the best of all the rest of the weapons that they have to fight against Christ and to fight against his return to save the world. Only they are going to be defeated. Then the seventh angel poured out his vial in the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is finished. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were on the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. It's going to level everything completely. The earth is now going to be in utter ruins. 
And the great city was divided in three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, Babylon the great, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island disappeared. No mountains were found. A great hail, each stone, the weight of a talent, which is about 180 pounds, fell from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague, for the plague was exceeding great. Now, just before the pouring out, of the seven last plagues. There's something else that takes place on the sea of glass. And this is the final thing that is going to take place before Christ and all the saints come back to the earth. And that is the marriage of the Lamb and his bride and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're rejoicing. We have seen the judgments. We have seen the things that have taken place. We're there with God. All the resurrected saints. Verse 1. And after these things I heard the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! It's going to be a celebration, brethren. The salvation and the glory and the honor and the power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. The blood vengeance of God. Remember God says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Well, here is where he has completed it. Then they said a second time, Hallelujah! And her smoke shall ascend up toward, uh, upward to the ages of eternity. The smoke from all of this destruction will come out of the atmosphere of the earth and into space, into the universe, and will travel in space forever. Verse 4, And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came forth from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and they're all gathered around the throne of God. And all who fear him, both small and great. And I heard a voice like the sound of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty has reigned. This is the proclamation of the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth to rescue man to repair the earth, to restore it to what it should be. And great, tremendous thing this is going to be. Verse 7, Let us be glad and shout with joy, and let us give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Yes. And it was granted to her that she, she should be clothed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now notice, brethren, how real this is. Remember this. If God has said it, it is as good as done. Verse 9. And he said to me, write. That's why we have the book of Revelation written down. There would be no way to understand the events at the end times without the book of Revelation, and then that interprets the rest of the prophecies of the Bible. And all those prophecies in the Old Testament referring to the end time, 
must fit into the events of the things of the book of Revelation. So he said, right. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then he fell down to worship him. And he said, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant. You worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then he saw a tremendous thing happen. Heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and on this one is Christ. And he who sat on it is called faithful in truth, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. And his eyes were like the flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knows except himself. And he was clothed with a garment dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. That we know, the other name we don't. And the armies in heaven were following him on white horses. That'll be all of us. Now we're going to come down with Christ. We're going to know what to do. We're going to know where to go. We're going to understand how to proceed. We're going to be given the power and understanding to help the human beings that live through all of this because some of them are going to live through it. And we will have the power to heal them, to restore them, to help especially heal their minds and their emotions of all the things that they went through, seeing all these things that, are, that will have occurred on the earth. All right. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, his word. The word of God is like a sword, and it cuts asunder. And in this case, he's going to order the destruction of those armies, like it says there in Zechariah 14, and their flesh is just going to fall right off their bones, and all their weapons will drop to the ground, and the, the, the whole gathering of these armies to fight against Christ is going to become one big, giant, almost unbelievable bloodbath of blood and guts and flesh and bones. And he had on his thigh name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God. God is going to have his cleanup party, all the birds, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of chief captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, the flesh of all, free and bond, and small and great. And I saw the beast, and the the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war with him who sits on the horse and with his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet who worked miracles in his presence by which he had deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Those two were cast alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone and the rest were killed by the sword of him who sits on the horse, even the sword that goes out of his mouth, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So this is what the day of trumpets pictures. This is a vital day in the holy days of God, and this is the transition day ending the rule of man, and now the next thing to do is to end the rule of Satan the devil. And we will cover that on the next holy day, the Day of Atonement.